my pleasure to have Donald Jeffries back on the show. He returns to uh, discuss his latest book, Bullyocracy, how the social hierarchy enables bullies to rule schools, workplaces, and society at large. Of course, Donald is a researcher and author. Among his several books are Crimes and Cover-Ups in American Politics, 1776 to 1963, Hidden History, an Exposé of Modern Crimes, Conspiracies, and Cover-Ups in American Politics, and Survival of the Richest, How the Corruption of the Marketplace and the Disparity of Wealth Created the Greatest Conspiracy of All. Don, Donald is also the host of I Protest, a weekly program which is carried on the Truth Frequency Radio Network. Donald, how are you doing? All right, Tim. Thanks for having me back. Good to talk to you again. Well, thanks for coming back on the show. This book, um, interesting. It's a, uh, I guess it's a, different than some of your other books, but but actually it is a sort of a theme, sort of a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. corrupt, uh, you know, bullies exploiting the weak little little guys and all that stuff. So, um, well, bullyocracy is bullying. Um, you you kind of focus on um, not only it's not just a problem of a certain age group. It's sort of a, a reflection of a sort of corrupt or sick culture and how. Certain institutions encourage this behavior, not just in high school, but after high school. As someone once said, high school never ends <laughs> in yeah, American yeah. life. So, uh, Bully Oxford, let you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is, uh, of course, it, you know, m- much of the, probably most of the book uh, does deal with the awful and that some of these stories are, you know, uh, hard for people to believe that I'm ri- not writing fiction, <clears throat> but these things do happen uh, where kids are being... Uh, you know, for for most high school, for most people, and the high school is where the the really starts. The middle middle school to some degree, but when they get to high school, the roles are established. And my contention is the social hierarchy, which is what makes popular students. And of course, without without unpopular students, you can't have you can't have popularity without unpopular without unpopularity. So you had you need the trench coat mafia types to exist for there to be a contrast with the shining stars and, and the people that are the celebrities and they're celebrities in these schools. The popular kids are basically the celebrities in their little world. The, uh, the, the high school quarterback, the prom queen, the prom king, uh, you know, the head cheerleader, that kind of thing. Uh, these are in every school and they're given perks and favors that uh, really reflect what we see in society at large uh, that the wealthy get. And I believe that the there's a correlation between popularity and – they're basically, they're the most successful students. Now, they may not always be the most successful academically, but in high school, the popular students are very seldom the best, the best students academically, unless they happen to also be good athletes, which they can be sometimes. But uh, for the most part, like the class valedictorian is usually not going to be the, the, you know, one of the most popular kids in the school. However, the, the big football stars will be, or the big basketball stars, uh, the cheerleaders, the prettiest girls uh, typically are. And I believe that's what creates bullying is that social hierarchy, because it's the, we've found in recent years that for a long time, there was the stereotype and people tend to think, well, bullies are these troubled youth. Maybe they come from a, a broken home. Maybe their dad's beating them. Maybe they're living in a trailer park and they don't have anything and they're bitter at the world. That's not the case. All the studies now show that it's the popular kids who overwhelmingly are the bullies, especially uh, for females. This mean girls phenomenon that we saw since the movie that came out in the early 2000s, that exists in every school. It's a clique of a queen bee and wannabes, and they're all very pretty girls. And uh, typically, you have to be good looking to be in those mean girl cliques. And what we're seeing, and that's one of the first things that really shocked me, and I started researching this, I started looking at the pictures of these teen girls who had killed themselves. And almost without exception, they're really good-looking girls, very pretty young girls. And certainly in my day, I I can never conceive of of one of these really good-looking girls in the school killing themselves. You know, you think you're on top of the world just looking like that. But the reason for that is because they're part of these these cliques. And what happens is they end up typically getting cyber-bullied or maybe they get talked into sexting in one of the popular... um, uh, jocks, uh, you know, picture of uh, them naked or something. It gets around the school and they can't take the humiliation. They can kill themselves. And so these were things that didn't used to happen 40, 50 years ago, certainly before the advent of the, of the internet. And so I talk a lot about the cyberbullying as well. But so while most of the book is, it talks about school experiences and how we see over and over again, and I think this is the theme of the book, is that uh, the parents will report to teachers or they'll report to principals, they'll report to school administrators, they'll report to the media, local media, they'll report to law enforcement if it's bad enough. And over and over again, we find virtually every in every case, the, the, the school administration 
the media and law enforcement will side with the bullies. They'll decide not to do anything. And the only time they tend to act is when the victim fights back. As soon as the victim fights back, then suddenly the teachers that somehow didn't notice the bullying, even inside their classroom, as happens inside the classroom many, many times, or uh, law enforcement that didn't act, whatever, suddenly the world caves in on these pen. They're, they're, penal- they're punished uh, much more severely than the bullies themselves were. And sometimes the bullies aren't even punished at all. So I, I wanted to, to try to examine this, why it's happening. And I think it's because this social hierarchy that starts in high school, as you said, it goes into the adult world. I mean, these bullies grow up and we, we tend to think they grow out of it. No, they don't grow out of it. They just become uh, the, the most often when they go to college, they, uh, they join the Greek life. They're in fraternities. And then we see the hazing rituals, which are just another form of bullying. And I point out, I go into this very uh, you know, deeply in the book about how many of these uh, pledges uh, end up dying every year in these fraternities. Some of the fraternities have, have been closed down. Uh, sororities, the same thing, not quite as severe, but it's the same type of thing where you uh, haze or basically bully the new uh, uh, pledges and uh, you know, it's initiation rituals and all that. And it's it's part of the same thing we see in high school. And I have all documented cases, and of course, when it's related to sports, uh, mostly in high school teams, but you see it sometimes in college teams as well, where uh, you know sexual type of things, where they'll uh, football players have been uh, you know caught inserting broomsticks up the butts of the younger boys and things like that, paddling them, all kinds of sexual th- things that are kind of homoerotic stuff, which they're kind of homophobic most of the time. So you wonder what's going on there, and the coaches tend to look the other way, or oh, this is boys being boys stuff. And it's all part of that same mindset. And then when you get into the adult world after college, then it becomes um, the roles are established. The bullying gets more sophisticated and it becomes the bully boss. It's a little bit different. And there's a lot of practical jokes. I point out the uh, it's all part of the same family, bullying, hazing, practical jokes. It's all intended to humiliate somebody, to try to make somebody feel bad. But practical jokes are an acceptable. Everybody accepts them. Everybody laughs and thinks, of course, we all want to have a sense of humor. But some of these practical jokes are hardly funny. And I I give some examples in the book. So my point is that high school never does that in terms of that, because the people that ran the high schools, and there's another myth is that when, uh, you know, well, that nerd's being bossed around, you know, they're going with the pocket protector, but, you know, he'll, he'll, when he grows up, he'll be the supervisor of the, the high school player whose life peaked in high school. Unfortunately, it's not true. All the studies show that the more popular you are in high school, the more successful you tend to be in life. So it's another myth that happens. And I have a whole section of the book where I talk about celebrities and uh, CEOs, politicians, and it's astonishing that uh, the vast majority of those people that lead us, the movers and sh- shakers of our society, were popular in high school. And I'm talking about people you wouldn't suspect. You know, most people wouldn't think of Rosie O'Donnell as her homecoming queen. She was. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a high school cheerleader. It doesn't look the part. Um, you had Pee Wee Herman was a high school wrestler. Uh, Woody Allen was a great high school athlete, the quintessential nerd. He was a great baseball and basketball player. So the list is in the book, and there, it's not, it's not, in, especially like for, for women, it's astonishing. Uh, virtually almost every high-profile woman you see in the media was a, was a cheerleader in high school. I mean, virtually every one that I could find a background on. And I think this is why they translate so well to the media, because they're basically cheerleaders for the state, and they, you know, they, they got their start cheerleading in high school, and they're still cheerleading. So it's a... It, it covers a lot of territory in the book, but I, I hope every and so far I've gotten you know good feedback because this is a subject bullying that it, it's touched almost every family. There's very few families that have been left untouched, whether either they were bullied themselves, they're still recovering from it, their kids were, they know somebody close to them that were. So I think a lot of people are going to be re- are able to relate to this book. One shocking thing is I think it's shocking to most people is that the behavior uh, that you uh, uh, detail in the book. Um, some might write it off as sort of a, you know, the students acting this way, in, immature people. But you, as you write, you write about in the book is often it is uh, either overlooked or even supported by, by the teachers, the administration of the school, uh, adults. There's no adults in the room in, this case, in, in these cases. Yeah, well, and, and, and even more shockingly, very often the teachers are the bullies. And I, I have, uh, you know, many cases in there where... You know, a kid comes home from school and, and tells, you know, mom and dad, you know, so-and-so, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, or, you know, doesn't like me. It just doesn't like me. 
uh, or sure, you know, or or say, you know, she's she said these nasty things to me. Can you and most of us, most parents, unfortunately, have the, the same problem we run into with conspiratorial type subjects. Most people have normalcy bias. Now, as a parent, if my kids had told me that, I would have been right on top of it because I would have been able to believe it because that's, you know, I'm in this, I'm in this different world. When you're awake to various things, you're you're willing to accept. Well, you know, you're not necessarily thinking, well, the teacher has to be sacrosanct. She has to be this honest, upright citizen. I, I know that that's not the case. But most parents kind of, you know, balk at that. Oh, come on. You know, you listen to what the teacher says. You know, Junior, you do what she says. You know, mm -hmm. give her one for you. That's, that's the, the attitude of most parents. But some parents uh, decided, okay, well, you know, they, they put recorders, uh, either tape recorders or in some cases um, video, uh, and, and uh, recorded these teachers bullying their students. And even when that happened, and I, I put in the book, I, I talk about how the, the system reacts to this. The system still is reluctant to, first of all, admit it, and secondly, to punish the teachers adequately. Almost all these teachers are still teaching that did this. And what's really sad is that uh, the most vulnerable students are the special needs students. And, of course, with the, you know, with the vaccines and whatever else is causing the shocking rise in the autism and people that are oh, kids. And, again, this is why so many people can relate to it. I've already talked to a couple parents that whose kids are – and, you know, almost every family – now, again, is touched by that. You're, you have a kid on the autism spectrum. Like every other kid has some form of Asperger's now, it seems like. There, there are so many kids on the spectrum, whether it's vaccines or whatever, and these kids are the primary targets now for bullies today. They're easy because they're, they don't fight back. They're, uh, they're, not, they're not socially uh, capable, really, of mounting any comebacks. They don't, it, so they're, they're the perfect targets for bullying, and they're apparently perfect targets for bullying by teachers as well, because most of the uh, students who were bullied by teachers were some kind of special needs students, which just, it just makes you shake your head, you know, why somebody would go into an occupation like that when they can't possibly, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you do something like that to a kid that, that has special needs? And there are examples of bus drivers as well. Everybody in the system where the bus drivers teasing uh, kids that uh, have special needs or whatever, or uh, enabling bullying, and, and the same old story we see, whether it's on the playground or on the bus, where as soon as a victim, if one of the victims decides to strike back and finally say, I've had enough, and unfortunately, a lot of times, the only way you can stop bullying is to punch the bully. And when, when you can defeat him, which you can sometimes, because most bullies are cowards, uh, then you're, you, your reputation is restored, and you're not going to be bullied anymore. Maybe you become a bully yourself, but a lot of these kids can't, especially if they have some kind of problems, they can't beat the bully up. So to say you just punch a bully, that, that does work. But a lot of these kids aren't physically capable of it. They have different issues. So you shouldn't have to even have that as any kind of uh, an option because the adults that are there, and that's the theme of this book too, is that I ask over and over again, because uh, so, so many of these bullying incidents happen inside the classroom. There was, a, there was a girl that was knocked unconscious inside a classroom. And I, I apparently, the only person that's asking, where was the teacher? Literally nobody, the media, nobody asks. Because that's the person that was responsible. If, I, if, you, if you or I gave a birthday party and uh, we were you know, at our house for little kids and one of the kids got knocked unconscious at our party, who's the first person they're going to look to? Mm -hmm. how, how did this yeah. happen, Mr. Kelly? You know, what, you know, how did you, you know, weren't you watching the kids? You know, they're, of course they're going to do that. But inside the classroom, where if we send our children to these institutions for uh, eight hours, whatever it is, every day, uh, for nine, nine plus months of the year, where they're basically uh, babysitters, state babysitters, we, we send them there. The least we can expect is that they come home in one piece or they don't come home terrorized, but too many of them do. I, I tell the story of a, a little kindergarten girl that came home from a, a kindergarten one day and looked like she had been in 15 rounds in the ring with Mike Tyson. And her mother naturally said, my God, what happened to you? And she, she was telling the story, well, this, this girl pushed her off the slide or something that had been bullying her. So, of course, she went to the school and they said, no, no, she fell. I mean, she fell. I mean, you're, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not an explanation. But this is what, unfortunately, parents, and there's another kid I talk about that drowned at school in a school pool. I mean, not all pool, school, high schools have pools, but this one did. And again, the, the teacher wasn't held responsible. And I, and I don't, you know, the least we can expect when we send our kids to school is that they don't die during the school day. But, you know, that happened. And again, I don't think the teacher, and to me, 
you know, if he's drowning, he should have been able to jump in and save him. And I, I don't understand how that happened. But another case I talk about, there was a, a kid that, whose body was found rolled up in a gym mat in the gym. And it's hard to tell from the stories. I actually tried to get a hold of their parents, but I, I, I wasn't able to locate them to ask them about this. But because uh, some accounts indicate the body was there for a couple days. Now, this was during the, the school was in operation. How can and there the school's explanation was that he was looking for his shoes and he fell in and his body got rolled up in the. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing. It's like a UFO explanation that it's swamp gas. I mean, that's how the level it was at, or the planet Venus or something. And this is, I mean, just imagine your child's body is found dead at school, and they actually ex the explanation they're giving you. And of course, the parents indicated that he had been bullied by some people on the football team uh, for a while. And, uh, you know, it happened, his body was found in the gymnasium, you know, the center mm -hmm. of the sports world. But again, nobody looks at these things. And uh, that's why I think, you know, I think my book is the first one really to call out these cases because while you hear so many people talk about, you know, no, zero tolerance for bullying and all that stuff, no bully, the bully project, there's all these groups out there. But few, if any of them, appear to be looking at this, I think, to looking at it correctly. I'm looking at it at from the standpoint that the schools are the problem. And almost all these groups want to work with the schools. As I point out, you can't, if you're working with the schools, that's like, you know, working with murderers to stop serial killers. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not, or having the fox, uh, you know, guard the hen house. That's the problem is the school, the problem over and over again is teacher inattentiveness. The failure of teachers to respond when parents go over and over again and report this, you know, they'll name the kid or kids who are doing the bullying. This is what she's doing. And somehow they can't prevent it over and over again. And it's, it's, it's just unconscionable that this happens. And I don't know if I'm alone with wolf crying out in the wilderness, but there, these, the stories are heartbreaking. I mean, you just, if you look through the book uh, and I wrote, I hope everybody if you're familiar with my blog, my blog is Keeping It Unreal, donaldjeffries.wordpress.com. I write there regularly, and I wrote an article that didn't – I mean, I wrote a, a story, and I, I had this woman's story for my whole – it's a pretty long article, too, because her story was, you know, it was like out of Dickens, 72-year-old woman, and she sent me all these details. It has to be read in its entirety to be believed. I, I mean, it's unbelievable what she went through, uh, just a tortured soul, and it's amazing she's – alive and she survived it all and didn't have a, an awful adult life but just to to keep it brief she culminated this you know this litany of abuse that she endured throughout her childhood being bullied and, and her senior year of high school they told her she was getting an award she had never gotten an award before so her mother and grandmother showed up they were so proud the principal called her up on the stage and gave her the award for the most unlikely to succeed in front of the entire school laughed at her and and went on to say what a bad student she was i mean what, completely, what, what, what year was this this was uh this was back well she's 72 so this would have been probably the 60s i mean it's, it was it, 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 i can't conceive of any time that, that i mean the principal was involved and uh, you just i mean try to process that that's the extent of this stuff but these people people like her they're uh they're outliers and they get uh you know they don't they don't get any attention and people just, okay, they laugh, they get their laugh, and they don't think about what happens to people like that afterwards. Now, a lot of people wouldn't have survived what she endured. They would have killed them. Today, probably, certainly, she would have been a suicide because it seems like uh, just it's more of an option now. You hear about it more, I guess, because she probably would have been cyberbullied as well, and that probably would have put her over the top. Fortunately, she didn't do that, but and she has led a, a little bit uh, more, better life than a lot of them. But I, I studied lots of cases of you know middle-aged adults that are still. That's why the cover of the book. You see the cover of the book. It's a, a series of montage of photographs from Rich Johnson, a photographer. We're talking about the faces of bullying. That where it has all the uh, the marks. That it's very powerful. I think that shows the marks that uh, they're not physical marks. They're not scars from beatings, but these emotional scars. And he has the names, you know, that are on there, the, 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 this terrible names that a lot of people are called and so forth. And these are the things. And, of course, you can't even picture, like, the uh, the emotional slighting of just, you know, uh, excluding people. People don't realize that it happens in the adult world over and over again, too. I, I have stories there of middle-aged women that are, that are traumatized still in their 40s. And a lot of them were bullied in high school, too. So they have that 
they carry that with them. And I, people, I think people sense the weakness or whatever and that they can do this to them. And, you know, it, just, it, it, it feels bad for anybody to have, you know, the girls in the office decide, okay, we're going to go to lunch now and make a big production of it and, and shun that one person. And it still happens. And it's kind of a mean girl thing. It's uh, aging mean girls. And this stuff is going on all the time, but it's not talked about. And instead, it just gets under the umbrella of bullying and people just kind of collectively I don't know what they think when they talk about it, because I've talked to lots of anti-bullying experts, too, and it's very disillusioning, Tim, because most of them seem to be on the side of the bullies as well. So I don't know who is fighting for the victims. Other than, I'm trying to in this book, but we should all be. It just seems like it's logical. I mean, there's, you know, when you have a, uh, I've been told it's complex. No, it's not complex. If you, you know when you see a playground altercation, you know who the bully is. It's the aggressor, usually the bigger one. And the other kid doesn't want to fight, it's, and, but it's invariably called a fight. It's never called like an assault, which is what it should be. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, I talked to parents of uh, children who, who committed bully side, as they call it, who killed themselves. And one was uh, you know, as young as 11 years old. And, and it's just amazing that uh, what, these, what parents go through and how that – and it's all because in every one of those cases, I couldn't find a single case of a kid that – was bullied one time and just went in and killed themselves. Usually this is a process, a lot of times years of abuse, and it's school inattentiveness, teacher inattentiveness, principal inattentiveness, uh, <clears throat> law enforcement inattentiveness, when you're trying to say, look, this, this person is torturing my child, and they don't do anything about it. And so it's, it's, this subject really is, it may seem different for me, but it's not because I, everything I write is trying to expose corruption, trying to expose wrongdoing, and fighting for the little guy. And obviously the little guys in, in this context are all the, the bullied victims, whatever their ages are, because uh, they're basically, you know, we, we, don't, we give tremendous sympathy, understandably, to victims of child sexual abuse. You know, when someone's raped or sexually assaulted as a child, we don't tell them to toughen up and get over it. We understand that's not the proper thing to say, but there's a lot of evidence that people that are really bullied relentlessly are just as scarred as people who are sexually abused. And we, but we tell them to toughen up. That's just part of childhood. That just happens. Grow well, out of. Well, how, how would you distinguish some of the horrific accounts that you you detail in your book? And say the normal stuff that uh, a child will go through in school. I mean, I remember growing up, uh, I went through several schools and invariably uh, being the new kid, you would be challenged. And this is the fifth, sixth, you know, seventh, eighth grade. And um, you'd fight it out for a little while and then settle down and you get accepted. Uh, right. Or just knowing how to cope with a bully. I, 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 Growing up, I coped with a couple of them. And one of them was just not standing down, whether it was just sort of outwitting him. And they just decide you're, you're you're not easy quarry, so they leave you alone. Yeah. Um, how would you just see, a lot of people listening to this will say, well, you know, kids have to grow up to learn to defend themselves, uh, being too overly protective, and then right. being uh, dismissive of these cases that are just extreme. How would you kind of yeah, strike that balance? Well, well, first of all, I think uh, what you're talking about, <clears throat> and in my day as well, was uh, these things. Uh, it sounds like probably took place out of out of earshot or sight of adults, mostly. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. yeah, on the yeah, playground that, or after yeah, school. Yeah, then it, it gets worked out by itself, you're right, and there's a, but that's, that's really, that's horseplay, and typically, uh, the, the, I don't know how you can prevent that. That's, that's the, you know, human nature. Yeah. But what I'm talking about was you, when you're in a controlled environment, because I, everything I talk about happens within the facilities, mm-hmm. or on the playground, now the playground of school is different than the playground when you're just out on the sand lots and you're playing with your friends, which kids actually don't do much anymore. You know, everything's organized now. So mm-hmm. You don't really get pickup games together like a, <clears throat> in the past or just go play tag in the neighborhood or something. Most of the time you arrange play dates or you're in organized sports or mm-hmm. dance class or whatever. But um, when, when you're on the playground at school and a lot of this stuff happens there, there's always an adult there, always. Even in, in sixth grade in elementary school, there's adults out there. These kids are never left unsupervised. So things that happen on the playground, and again, I, I, I note over and over again, you can say, well, the teacher can't look at, be everywhere at once. or look. That's true, but they always seem to catch when the victim fights back. Then they're <laughs> yeah. there. The yeah. second, you know, they're yeah. like in hockey where they have the second man in or whatever, but uh, what the referee does. So... That's what I find amazing is that they, they somehow don't – but that's one thing. But some of these things happen inside the classroom. I said there's no excuse for that. 
I mean, most class sizes are not going to be over 30 at tops. And most classes today, a lot of classes, probably most, have a teaching assistant in them as well. So there's usually probably two adults in the class. <clears throat> so for a, somebody to be knocked unconscious in a class or really bullied relentlessly inside a classroom, I don't see how that can happen. Well, is this a, a, a symptom or a sign of uh, a society in rapid decline uh, and decay? Because it seems like a lot of these... Um cases the kids don't know they don't acknowledge like normal boundaries no they don't but i and i think they i think they know they learn early on the bully types what they can get away with and uh but yeah you know, i think it is symptomatic of of the deterioration of everything else i mean why should our schools be in mm -hmm. any better shape than anything else because again the people in charge are either corrupt incompetent or both and i would argue that most of the teachers are not corrupt i don't think but I would argue that they're incompetent, and I'm not sure what what they're looking at. But I mean, I give you uh, one of the examples. The first example I talk about in the school was there was a, a terrible, tragic incident back in uh, around 2000 or so, where uh, there was a little girl in Cleveland that was shot to death. In I think she I think they were in, I think it was kindergarten uh, by her kindergarten classmate in school. Now I looked into the background of the uh, of the the kid. And, of course, he was from a horrific environment. He was living in a crack house with his uncle. His, both his parents, I think, were in jail. Uh, so, and social services had been out, but somehow had let him stay in that environment. Again, all these they, they were corrupt at every level. Social services, the same social services that will hound you know, honest parents about taking a picture of their kid naked in, the, in a bubble bath or something. Uh, they'll investigate them. And, and, and ruin their reputation, but something like this, they couldn't figure out how to get him out of the environment. I mean, they, they take kids that, you know, have a, uh, that they, they, they think their uh, parents like Adolf Hitler or something, they'll take them away right away. But something like this, they, they couldn't figure it out. And the police had been called to the residence, didn't do anything. Typically, everybody failed at every level, but this kid in kindergarten had been expelled a couple times already. He had been uh, reprimanded over and over again for cussing, and he had even attacked he attacked other students, including the girl he eventually killed. He had stabbed her with a pencil before. Somehow he was still in that kindergarten classroom. And when this happened, when tragedy happened, no one talked about the teacher except me, because this is inexcusable. Uh, he, he, this happened inside the classroom. This kid came to school that day with a gun and a knife. And he was brandishing them about openly inside the classroom. Now, keep in mind this kid's record. That teacher should have had one eye on him at all times. This was probably the most problematic kindergarten in the history of the world. And somehow she didn't notice this. She finally did notice the knife and went and took the knife away and didn't even send him to the principal's office. And somehow didn't notice the gun, which he was waving around in the class. So he ends up killing the girl no one questioned that teacher. No one criticized her. Nobody knows her name. I'm the only one even talking about her. And afterwards, they put the icing on the cake. Of course, Bill Clinton, I think, was president. Maybe it was the 90s. And of course, he 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 looked at the typical you know social justice warrior way, saying there's too many guns. We need <laughs> you know, That was his reaction to it. And uh, and the uh, I think it was the yeah, law against uh, uh, kindergarten students <laughs> having guns. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he bought that legally, but uh, the. Uh, I think it was the chief of police or somebody that said we need to, we need to the DA or something said we all need to hug this boy, and I I, I put I found the kid's profile now he's you know a young adult he learned nothing he's a, he's either a gang member or a gang wannabe guy so he learned nothing from having nothing of course I don't know what you can do to a kindergartner but you certainly can at least put him in some kind of juvenile reform or something and, and figure if you can reform him but. Uh, but that's a like, perfect example that no one – and that's the most extreme example I can think of somebody getting shot inside the class. But the teacher – to me, if I'm investigating that crime, the first person I'm going to ask – again, we go back to it's a birthday party. Some kid brings a gun to a birthday party and shoots some other kid at your birthday party. They're going to question you first. You didn't see that gun? And again, this is the, this is the Teflon nature of te teachers. Get a, no one wants to criticize them. And I, I, I don't understand why, because they're the responsible party there. You know, if, if they can't maintain the – and they, we're not – most of the time, we're not – I'm not talking about, uh, <clears throat> you know, really awful uh, inner city schools 
we're talking about these are these are schools that are you know that seem to have relatively good reputations. I, I could maybe have sympathy if you know maybe all the students were armed or something in some awful inner city school and the teachers like in the middle of warfare or something. But mo- almost all the time that's not the case. But nobody looks at them. And again, I think that's why my book is different and why I'm kind of uh, getting a little resistance from the anti-bullying expert stuff because for whatever reason they want to work with these people. Well, if you look at the cases in my book. You're not going to want to work with them because the teachers, too. I mean, there and the few times that I found that teachers did try to do, like one, one in one case, uh, do something right. Now, sometimes they're too extreme. Like in one case, a teacher, a bully had been bullying everybody in the class, and she told him to stand up in front of the class and told everybody to come up and just uh, you know slap him or something to see how he felt about them him hitting. Now that was that was extreme. But and of course she was I think she was I don't know if she lost her job or whatever. But in another case I thought it was actually a pretty good idea where she she brought the bully up in front of the class and she asked everybody who had been bullied by him to tell him how they felt. But I, I thought that was a pretty good idea, and she was reprimanded. And and I, so I don't know maybe they know that if they they try to go up against bullying there this is a resistance they're going to. Uh, going to get but it's the stories in the book are just uh, amazing i said i can't even you know to to try to think of the most extreme one is uh is difficult but people are not going to believe in it but i do think and i've already again heard from uh that 72 year old woman is the most uh notable example but people who uh have dealt with this in school and it's always the same story it's always the same story they go to the teachers they go to the prince the schools the schools did nothing oh that's the that's the mantra I mean, you can you can conclude that the schools do nothing because over and over again, parents from all over the country say the same things. And in the most tragic examples, too often what happens is because the schools do nothing, the kids end up killing themselves. And their blood, you know, their their deaths are on their hands because they could have prevented this. All they had to do was provide, and you know, not a not a like a, you said a helicopter parent type. Of, you don't have, you don't have to provide a cocoon, but you need to let them be kids. But that, not, that should never happen where a child should go to school and be tortured like that to such an extent that they want to take their lives at such a young age. And we're seeing kids as, as young as six, seven years old that have killed unthinkable 50 years ago. Like that one parent I talked to, the dad, that the boy was 11. I mean, I couldn't conceive of an 11-year-old when I was 11. It would just be unthinkable that a young but that's the world we live in now, and I think that once they hear about other kids doing it, I mean, the, the teen suicides rates are up to the roof now, and I think it's largely because of bullying. But, um, you need to look at the problem correctly to solve it, and I don't think that anti-bullying activists and all the schools with the no the no bully uh, you know signs and zero tolerance for bullying, most often they have the most bullying. And the parents complained bitterly afterwards. You know, my 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 student was bullied, and this no, they'll stand under the zero tolerance signs and things like that. Uh, so we need to look at it a different way. But we'll see how this book goes. I mean, I, I think it'll uh, it'll get a lot of attention from readers who've gone through this. But I don't know that uh, we'll see if any of the people that uh, they're involved in these groups because I had to contact a bunch of them, and I'm not getting very many places. One of them put me on their mailing list. <laughs> I said. I, you know, I, I, I don't really mind being on your mailing list, but I was trying to tell you about my book, and I would think that you guys would be, if you don't, aren't, if this, this should be the book you've been waiting for. But somehow I sense that they're going to, I know one of the people I talked to that wrote a book that was pretty decent about bullying already didn't, I mean, a lot of good people have written blurbs. Jesse Ventura wrote the blurb on the back cover, and uh, I think Naomi Wolf's going to write a blurb, but uh, this particular person said, well, I've read some of your book and I just I can't write a blurb for it because I, I believe that the bullies are victims, too. And that's what you and this this is an anti-bullying person. And that's where you run into where they say they don't want to punish the bullies. And my, my point is, well, how are you ever going to hold them accountable? I don't understand it. It's like, you know, you, you know, if if they're not if they're not. And again, I think it's they don't want to go up against the social hierarchy and uh Let's face it. You know these these the, the kids that are the, the the popular kids are usually the, the the more charming ones, and because they have the social they already have the sociopathic or psychopathic traits that uh, of success. And we can talk about that too. There's that uh, study that was done uh, in uh, England. I quote the results of that in the book where they show that the uh, the occupations that have the highest level of um, people in them that have psychopathic traits are the most all the most successful occupations. Doctors 
lawyers, CEOs, entertainers, uh, clergymen, well, police, of course, and things like that. But the leadership, these are the traits people respect. All the studies show going to elementary school when they've done polls with teachers and students, the bullies are always most popular kids. And, and the teachers know who they are, and they say they're mo the most popular kids. So it, it works for them. Why, why would they change their behavior? And, and, and it's, if they're male bullies, it gets the attention and the favor of the best-looking girls. The best-looking girls, girls usually for the girls. And uh, so it's... A yeah, uh, that's um, to the extent here, you, know, you in the book, you also talk about um, uh, high school itself and how high school kind of creates this environment. Um, I, you know, the, 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 what we think of the normal high school is, you know, it's a, it's a institution. It's an art. It's artificial. It's created. This isn't something that necessarily exists. How in nature, or this is necessarily no. how you know young kids w would develop, it, you know, or get educated. Many and go in these large institutions, centralized institutions. Then they have. When you talk about the uh, emphasis or the importance that's placed on sports yeah. and sort of uh, uh, you know uh, athletic uh, uh, ability. And you know the the phenomenon of the letter jacket and the cheerleader and these things yeah. have, you know the you know the players are supposed to wear a letter jacket if they're on the team varsity, wear a coat and tie on game day. Why is that so important? Yeah. And uh, an uh, institution is supposed to be geared towards academics, but sports has corrupted the entirety of education all the way up now from you know junior high on up. Um, and this this kind of supports the bullying culture because it's obviously emphasis on physicality and these things and also. Yeah. What who's being glorified here? With, you know, they make people go to pep rallies. Yeah, exactly. You know, people have no interest in the team sports, and they, they nope. create this artificial interest in team sports and under the guise of school spirit. I remember them making us go. I remember uh, by the time I turned eighteen, I could just walk off campus, and no, no one could keep me from going, <laughs> make me yeah. go. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, th there's a certain culture that's created. Not to mention the fact. Um, I mean, I noticed a lot of the bullying issues. At least my experiences when you have a single sex education. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, not, not, I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't think it does as much, right? Because I think the, it's especially for boys, they're trying to get the favor of the girls. Mm -hmm. And I talk about it in our culture. You, you look at how many movies have ever been made in Hollywood where the leading man, now, of course, now a lot of times the leading lady because you have feminists kicking in there, but where the leading man doesn't punch somebody out. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, a, it's always stressed. And of course, we teach our kids. I've taught my kids that, but we, we teach our kids that you, that's not, you don't settle disputes by fighting, that uh, might doesn't make right. But our society, all the culture, every message they get from the culture is that even though they have movies like talking about bullying, but invariably the, that's always resolved with overpowering the bully and beating him up mm -hmm. in, in movies. But in it just in movies going back to Jimmy Cagney and, and, and people like that. It was always punching out guys, and the dames, or you know, their dames were always there to, oh, to swoon over them and and you know, it, it fall into their arms right after they punch the guy out. And it was it, the message was clear that you know if you can beat the other guy up, you're right. So might does make right, and that's you know let's let's settle this. Well, how are we gonna so this how they're gonna settle it is to fight. So if you win in a physical fight, that proves you're right, and that's. That's just, I think it's a poisonous message for uh, a society there if we're trying to really, uh, you know, be uh, civilized. But, and it, it contradicts everything parents But it's a little sicker, kids. though, if people are drawn to or attracted to a personality uh, who, uh, who is clearly picking on a weaker individual. Yeah, it is. And unfortunately, and I talk again, that's why my, my book, parts of it won't be popular with uh, feminists either because I, I, Again, I think uh, male bullies are enabled. And while you talk about the single sex in an all male school, they won't, they don't have that. Where you know they don't have the. Uh, I'm going to try to show off and impress the girls by beating this nerd mm -hmm. up, and uh, show them how tough I. I show her how tough I am, and then she'll like me. And that happens so often. But without, if we had these young girls instead running to the aid of the uh, the, the victim. And saying, you know, get out of here, you, 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 you know, leave him alone, that kind of stuff, because they're not going to punch the girl typically. But we don't see that very often. Maybe it happens sometimes, but for the, the most, for the most part, uh, being an alpha male and and showing that you can overpower another male uh, it seems to win the favor of the prettiest girls in school. And that I think that's the part of the problem we see in the adult world. Again, I have quotes in there from feminists. I have I don't know how far you got in the book, but. Um, 
there was this, uh, and these are feminists that are talking about how uh, they want a man who will take them and know what know, the man who knows what he wants and takes it. It's like, <laughs> it's but, to me, I can't as a as a naive guy, I can't distinguish that from rape. But uh, you know, and uh, nice and guys again, finish I, last. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, and that's you know that's I, I use that quote in the book a lot. And you know, Leo DeRocher, who was a, who was a class A bully, by mm-hmm. the way, yeah, he came up with that. And the fact that no one. Everyone kind of nods their head in the agreement, nice guys finish last. We all acknowledge it. And what does that say about our society that nice guys finish last? And I think if you're of a society where you're acknowledging nice guys finish last, is it any wonder then that bullies prevail in school or in boardrooms or anywhere in our society? Because you've already acknowledged, yeah, nice guys finish last. You can't be a nice guy. Well, I don't know what that says about – I don't think it's just American uh, culture, but – it's very sad because I, I'm a nice guy, you know, and I I, uh, I try to be anyhow, and I, it always depresses me when I see people that aren't. And, but apparently, a lot of people just aren't. They just, uh, you know, they, they admire these other qualities and the qualities that every bully has. I mean, there's a fine line, for instance, between aggressiveness and bullying and just aggressive people. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's very, it's hard to be aggressive and not be bully. Yeah. Yeah. Be bully. And, and yet that's, I mean, it's sales. I mean, every salesperson that's successful is aggressive. Bosses are, we've all had bully bosses. I mean, that's kind of, uh, the, the, that's the, what they want from a, you know, the construction site to, uh, the boardroom of a fortune 500 company. They look for that mindset. Somebody who can bark orders, who can control people, who can, uh, who can not, you know, not practice what he preaches because typically they're hypocrites as well. But uh, we've all experienced that. So to a great degree, I think the people that are in charge, the people that are making decisions are people that if they're not real card-carrying bullies, at the very least, they have at least some of these psychopathic traits that mark them for success, aggressiveness, uh, lack of... Well, is, is the system designed for this or is this just happening that something that this kind of developed over the years like, uh, well, yeah, somebody told me today capitalism creates it I, I don't know i don't know how it is in other socialist countries but i think i think there's something to be said for that because there again that's that winning mentality and I, I i say this is somebody who loved sports played sports a lot and mm-hmm. it's, i'm very i hate it about myself i love to win and i hate it about myself i really do but it's just part of my personality and that but everybody in america uh we, we look at like uh for instance coaches i talk about sports, I mean, every good, almost every good coach I've ever seen, at any level, is a, a grade A bully. Yes, they just are. <laughs> I mean, they, they just are. So, and but as as long as they win, they get away. They can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Listen to the coach. Now, if they lose, it's a different story. Then it's not working. But and again, it's that winning thing. It's you know, Vince Lombardi said, you know, winning is the only thing. You know, and uh, it, you just win, baby. You know that that kind of thing. And uh, and then there was a, a, I talk about cheating too, or so many of them cheat. Or, I mean, there's there's a, there's one of the quaint coaching expressions: is if you're not cheating, you're not trying. I mean, this is what coaches tell you. Well, I mean, and we wonder why there's so much corruption in sports and yeah. college level when you yeah. have you know now it's just normal to bring in ringers from the ghetto, say, for a winning football team. And yeah, this is exactly. this is true in the high school level. Never yeah, exactly. We talked about the Little League World Series where you had that, mm-hmm. uh, was it from the Dominican Republic, where they, uh, that kid, I think it was Danny Almonte was his name, where everybody knew he was like 15 or something, and uh, but they brought him in as a ringer. And, of course, invariably, if the players aren't white, then, uh, you know, you get attacked for you know, cries of racism and so forth. But all done, uh, ethics fly out the window when you just, again, just win. You, know, you just want to win. And our society, I mean, somebody like a Bobby Knight, you know, one of the most successful coaches ever – he was psychotic, and he could, he could not have held a job in any other field. I mean, throwing chairs, punching players, hitting. I mean, he was a genuine nut. He would blow his stack. I you know I, I don't know how he's still alive. I mean, the, the, uh, who knows what his blood pressure went up to during these games? He was genuinely nuts, but because he won so often, he was accepted. Coach Knight, Woody Hayes is another one. There and most of these coaches are like that. The successful coaches, and if you look at them. Then you, you you see why this and again that's so much of this is connected to sports. Sports means so much to this culture, and again I think it begins in high school where you see the amount of money. I talk about the new stadiums that have been built at some of these uh, Texas fo- the, West Texas football, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that they they're spending more on that than they're spending, but they you know they're not buying new computers for all the kids and that kind of thing. And it's it tells us where our priorities are, and 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 you run into these situations where. Um, Football players have gang raped girls. Mm-hmm. 
And in, in all these cases, it's usually a successful football programs that have won state championships. The community sides with the players instead of the girl. They shame the girls. In one case, it was, it was a, a girl. I, she was developmentally disabled. I don't know to what degree, but she wasn't, quote, normal. And they viciously raped her. And the, the community was on the side of the players. I mean, I don't know what you can say. What does that say about your neighbors? And how do you, you know, it, it's hard to exist in, in a society that's that sick. But I have the examples in the book, and it's, uh, it happens. One of the mothers I've communicated with several times, you know, her child was, uh, her daughter was raped at, I think, age 13. Uh, and another girl, I think, was the same age, right, by, uh, you know, senior football players. And they filmed, a lot of times they film these things now. So I said, you have video evidence. It shouldn't be any, you know, it's pretty clear what happened. But still, there's doubt. The media tries to cause it because they're football players. And as I say, if these were, you know, members of the audiovisual squad, <laughs> you know, would, would the community defend them? No, I, yeah, 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 yeah. There's I think a... of other balls, you know, they, you know, that would be, you know, castrate them. That would be the cry. But because they're football players, I talk one of the uh, one of the more notable examples. Uh, CNN covered the trial of these two football players and. Uh, the uh, reporter Poppy Harlow, who I, you know, I, I couldn't find any background about her, but I, I would bet almost everything I own she was a high school cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> you know, was was uh, anybody named Poppy? You know, but uh, she uh, she was almost in tears talking about these young men, big football players, and their lives may be over. I mean, she again nothing about the victim. And this is CNN. Now, does CNN usually act like that when a woman is on, you know, a woman is accused of somebody of rape? And if that, again, that had been a couple file clerks, you know, do you, do you think she would have acted that way? But, uh, and that's, again, I think we see everybody in our society, whether they want to admit it or not, they may, they may blanch at the, at the word bully. But when those feminists are talking about they want a man that takes them, when uh, Poppy Harlow is breaking down in tears about the football players, they're all they're all just like high school girls again in the halls where they're swooning over the the popular kids the big jocks and we it's just it just translates over into the adult world and I don't think anybody until me when I, writing this book nobody has called out the social hierarchy and I I know it's going to be a tough road to hoe because I know people first of all you have people that profit if you had a I mean I was like you know I wasn't picked on in school I wasn't bullied but. I was like maybe like you. Mo the vast majority of people going to high school are like background players. We don't want to be there. We find it boring. <laughs> you know, we just, we're trying to struggle to stay awake in algebra class and things like that. And, and most of the teachers are really boring too. I mean, I don't know how interesting you can make math or something, but um, a, a lot of them didn't really try to do that. At least my teachers didn't. So we don't really want to be there. Well, the they whole just, structures. You're, you're you're in class for 45 yeah. minutes, 50 minutes. A bell rings. And like yeah. a dog, you have to get up and go to the next class, <laughs> exactly. salivate. Then you have your lunch period. It's all very – the whole structure is designed to sort of – it's yeah. psychological warfare. In and my and one, of the, yeah. one of the great anonymous quotes, and I found – they're all the time when I found these anonymous quotes on the internet forums, mm -hmm. they're always more astute and profound compared to the quotes from the so-called experts. But uh, this one person was talking about how – yeah, exactly what you're talking about, how uh, it's where you learn to be uh, – you know, to follow rules. Well, this is the whole the the psychology of a pep rally, mandatory yeah. attendance. So I, I could care less about our basketball team and our football team. Why should I care about these five men on the – boys on the court or exactly. on the field? I don't relate to them. I mean <laughs> – Exactly. I don't we don't – but again, what does it – again, what does that do? The, they want a crowd. They want an audience, and that's what most of us are. Yeah. We're in high school. We're the audience. We're watching these festivities, and for those – the popular kids – they're the little celebrities. For them, I, you know, high school must be like grand. It's like you know, being in Hollywood and going to parties every day. And for the people at the bottom, the trench coat mafia types who, again, the popular people can't exist without the unpopular contrast. They well, have this, to have this has been normalized in movies, you know, whether it's oh. Heathers oh, or yes. Can't Buy Me Love or yeah. Mean Girls. Yeah. And I know there's always some story to how, you know, how the, night, the cool kids have to make friends with, with the nerds and yeah. that sort of stuff. <laughs> but it's normalized. The story, yeah. the whole you know, the whole atmosphere. Yeah, it is. And it, it's, it, it's, it's probably exaggerated to something like my kids used to tell me, you know, that oh, stuff doesn't go on in our school. Nobody's stuffing nerds in lockers and stuff. And I don't know, maybe it doesn't happen in all schools, but I do know that everybody in those schools knows who, you know, you may not, the popular kids don't know who everybody is. But well, that everybody, also, the, the, the popular kids don't look, look like they're 25. No, exactly. exactly. Hollywood is <laughs> always, always 25 years old.
<laughs> right. No. But if you just wonder what that does to, you know, and that's why I start the book off when I talk about, you know, when, when every for every Friday in high schools all across the country, members of the football team wear their, wear their jerseys mm-hmm. to school. So if you don't know who they are, then you do know. And I said, nobody thinks about what this means, what it does to them. How does that, you know, uh, stroke their egos and build their egos, their self-esteem? Well, why is that but, more important than, say, someone who aces a, a trigonometry? Exactly. Why, why wouldn't you have the members of the National Honor Society wear, uh, you know, some big yeah. green hat or something? You know, that, that's because, again, because they're not – everything that the schools say is that academics are not important, that sports is number one. And basically being good looking, because I, t- I talk about these, uh, really, even something like the prom. What does the prom mean? The prom has become this absurd thing with these uh, elaborate prom proposals, and it's another way where young boys can, can learn to spend lots of money on young on girls. And they're, they're, they're nice. but, uh, and then you have the prom. I mean, what is the pro- what, who is the prom queen and the prom king? Again, it's just to, to lavish more favor on the same kids. Same thing with the homecoming king, homecoming queen, homecoming court where they even ape royalty. <laughs> I, you know, they a... <laughs> I took no part of that in high school. <laughs> yeah. And, no, I mean, of course, yeah, I, was, I was, well, first of all, I don't think they had, uh, well, maybe they had, I guess, I think they had a prom, prom queen. I don't even know if they had a, a king. I, I don't know. Maybe they did. I, just, I paid so little attention to that. They were I starting that know. like in the, in, they started that in junior high, where I was. Yeah. Well, which I thought was absurd. Well, well, there's, well, that's typically where the hierarchy starts is in middle school because that's when you switch classes mm-hmm. and uh, you learn to, you know, you learn to, you hear the bell like Pavlovian dogs, you know, you make sure. I mean, I, I still have dreams at 63 years old. I, that's one of my <laughs> dreams and I'm not going to get to class in time. That's, I still dream about it. I, <laughs> yeah, you, most people do actually. It's funny. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's always a nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. No, I, or I, 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 you know. God, what's the teacher going to say? I didn't, I didn't do this assignment and stuff, and I'm still thinking about that. But that's how, that's how strongly. I mean, I still remember. And, and you know, when you, that's when you first. Uh, now, I, I, by the time my kids got into school, and uh, my youngest graduated from high school uh, nine years ago or something, eight nine years ago. But by the time they were in school, you did you weren't forced, you weren't required to dress out for gym anymore. But again, I, I still have nightmares about seventh grade gym class. Because we, we had to dress out. We had to get stark naked. And, of course, you know, seventh grade, some kids were developed. Some yeah, kids yeah, weren't. yes, yeah. So it was, it was a whole thing. And the ones that were were running around, flopping it around. The others were running around, covering it up. And, and the gym teacher, you had, to, you had to take a shower, and you had to walk up to him where he'd just sit there and stare at you and give you a towel. I yes. mean, it was just barbaric. I mean, you think of it now, it's almost like, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know what they're uh, – thank goodness, again, apparently they stopped doing it, at least in my area. I don't know if they do it, but well, – what, what struck me was how often the gym instructor would, would actually pick on the vulnerable kids, the teacher. Oh, yeah, sure. Slap them in the ass with towels and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they did. Definitely, they were – well, gym teachers, you know, we had that saying, those who can do and those who can't teach – and those who can't teach teach gym. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and so these gym and and that's why you know when you look at coaches, all gym teachers, just like if you look at security guards in most places, mm-hmm. they're all want to be cops who didn't make the grade. And gym teachers are all want to be coaches. They all want, and so they have that mentality. And uh, they're they're you know I, I remember as an, although I wasn't bullied, amazingly I always I was I was an obese child. Um, I lost weight right before I went to high school at the right time. But uh, up until that point, I was really fat when most kids weren't fat. So I stood out. I looked like a little Eric Cartman. That's how mm-hmm. I was, you know, from, from <laughs> I had kind of his personality, too. But because of that, I, I could deflect. I had a really keen wit and a good sense of humor. I could make people laugh, and mm-hmm. that always helps. And that kept it away from me. And I was always really good at sports, too, even though I was fat. So I, I didn't really get bullied. But still, I knew people knew I was fat. And gym, the gym teachers didn't have any... Uh, Sympathy for me. And I still have, again, I have nightmares about, oh, we're going to do gymnastics today. And that, oh, you know, they're going to expect me to run up and somehow throw my obese body over this high horse or climb the rope. You know, we've seen that over and over. That's a real thing that happens where they, they make the fat kid try to go, and you know you can't do it. And the, the gym teacher's kind of snickering, all right, then you couldn't, you know, they'll make you, they'll humiliate you for, you know, 30 seconds or something while the kids are laughing. And, and it's, it's really sadistic. But, and I know that still goes on. 
So I, you know, maybe some of this stuff got formed with me at that point, but I really started, uh, I think my mindset happened when my um, niece was born with Down syndrome when I was about 11, 12 years old. And uh, when I started seeing how people treated her, even adults, I think I started looking at the world. And that's when I really started to uh, kind of have an empathy for people who were more vulnerable because of what she went through. And uh, when you when you seen you know when someone you love and you and you've seen adults, respectable adults, you know, say retard and and laugh, just laugh at her for no reason. I mean, I, I saw that as a kid. I, I just I was amazed because you see the darker side of people. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it's. Uh, so it changed my perspective on things, and I think I dedicated the book to her and my brother. My brother also went through uh, uh, something like that. It's kind of a complicated incident, but it was it was bullying related, and his life, you know, was never the same because of it. And I think those are the two reasons I was drawn to the subject, and I dedicated the book to them because I know there are lots and lots of other people out there whose whose lives were destroyed because they went to these educational facilities they're required to go to, mandatory mm-hmm. every day. And the adults in charge allowed them to be sometimes viciously abused and did nothing about it and were never held accountable. And still, it appears, most people are are reluctant to hold them accountable. And I, I, I don't understand it. I really don't because you're never going to solve this problem if you don't look at, at, at who's responsible. And in the case of, like I said, you can't stop bullying out in the streets or where the kids are. That's That just happens, you know. But although you can you know go to their parents or whatever it happens, but I, I don't think that happens that often. I think most bullying happens within the schools or later you know on college campuses, and then later in the workplace where they're all authority figures are around and it's allowed to happen by those authority figures. Well, uh, uh, Chris, uh, an important question and perhaps the, the bigger question is um, you talk about a lot of the cyber bullying. The harassment online, uh, uh, on Facebook, a lot of these uh, accounts, <clears throat> where the the with, with today's media and the internet and social media, you can't get away from it anymore. Meaning that it's the, the more that the kids are drawn into the into the internet, the uh, social media, staring at that screen, and it's so much part of their lives, it actually makes them more vulnerable. Which may account for the higher rates of suicide. Meaning there was a time they they leave school, they get away from it. Now they're being bullied twenty four seven. 365 days a year because of the media and maybe you require you maybe this will require something like a Marshall McLuhan a media analyst yeah. to, to say well is is the media is the media changing it's obviously media changes us TV changes radio changes now the internet has changed yeah. and um, not to mention the fact that a lot of these kids are constantly watching uh, either social media or like shows reality shows which um, sort of uh, promote a psychopathic approach constant fighting insulting down trying to get one up on somebody you know real housewives or cooking wars and other people have have done studies on this that a lot of these programs are funded by the pentagon and by the intelligence agencies sure and if you take into the account of media and the internet and who who really created it that was designed mass media is always designed for mass mind control or manipulation that's one thing you know is tv was developed under this radio was researched with this that's it goes back to the radio research project project at Princeton, uh, how to create mass hysteria. It goes back to the uh, Halloween Eve broadcast of War of the Worlds. That was done yes. on purpose. That was that yep. was a, that was a, a study, yep. Uh, yep. Um, and so all the, all this media, all these shows we, we watch, the kids now watch more than ever, especially this so called reality show. All this behavior is being promoted. It's being it's, yep. it's, it's, as entertainment. It's being promoted though. At the same time, they're constantly engaged in social media, and so they're, they're they've become not only have they become intensely narcissistic, also they become really really self conscious. You know, even more so than maybe in previous generations. Like when I was a kid, uh, maybe going through navigating these things, we didn't have the internet. No. I, I had a respite. In fact, I came from a big family. The school was always, for quite frankly, the school was always marginal to me. It was always like, that school and I have my family life. It didn't matter that much. And so as people become more atomized, become more product-driven or desire to get things, image these things, they become much more vulnerable to these. Absolutely. And, and the, the cyberbullying, it really has taken it to a new level. And you have, uh, because social media is a reality for everyone now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I certainly live in. I mean, I'm I'm plugged into that matrix 24 hours a day, almost ridiculous. And and I, you know, I get distraught when I don't get enough likes and comments on the stuff <laughs> I post. So I I can imagine how the young girls are. Yes. You know, and, and uh, but uh, 
you know, some oh, you look you look ugly, you look fat, and all it takes is that kind of stuff. But it's it's really inexcusable. Again, I I talk in the book about how the anti the law enforcement, the anti bully experts, the psychological experts, all they all will deny links between cyberbullying and suicide, even when the direct evidence. I mean, it's there. The post there, go ahead and kill yourself. I don't care. You're stupid, ugly. It's there. Or they'll these kids will leave suicide notes behind, naming bullying as the reason they're doing it, and even sometimes naming the actual bullies. And they still will claim it's complex. They're, and a lot of times they'll try to blame the. As, as they're already you're already losing your child, which is tragic enough. But then it's compounded by law enforcement and um, the psychological anti-bullying experts, basically, uh, and the teachers even, who didn't respond and who are the really ones that are responsible, blaming and smearing the family. I saw it in many cases. Well, you know, it was family life, and I don't want to say anything, but there were, she had problems at home and all this stuff. And it, it happens over and over again. And it should be easy to find out who the culprits are uh, when it's cyberbullying because the evidence is left behind. And they still... Well, not they're still reluctant to do something about it, but yeah, we can never. Well, I think what's going on? Why they to do something about it? Because to really to to address the real issue, you have to get radical, get to the root of the problem. You have to start questioning the entire public school, high school system, and the model we're yes. operating on. You have to question the fact, as a society, we've allowed children twenty four seven, three sixty five access to media, which is virtually unregulated. Anything is this? When is this ever healthy for a developing child? To have that much exposure, interaction with strangers, with media stimuli and everything. and But that would require taking a step back and sort of uh, undoing the past 30, 40 years. And you, 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 I mean, you question, I mean, one thing in the book you talk about, how this is largely a post-war phenomenon. Yes. The automobile culture you talk about. Yep. That's a big yep. part of it. You know, so we didn't have, the, I mean, this didn't say there weren't bullying and problems in the 1940s and before. Obviously, there are issues. But this is something that's uniquely American and something that can really... The, the, what we acknowledge is the, the high school, the cool, the, the cool image you talk about in the book too. Hollywood yeah. is promoted, and this this feeds in. Yeah, well, it's it's really with the. I, I believe teenagers were born in the 1950s, and yeah. I quote an expert on that, where you really didn't. There's no evidence before the 50s, and the you know, first one movie probably promoting this was uh, the Wild One. Mm -hmm. With Marlon Brando, who was one of the probably the first a young Marlon Brando, who's kind of this motorcycle part of a motorcycle gang when the gangs were being promoted again, glorification of these uh, mm -hmm. these gangs are all obviously have huge bully characteristics. They're looking for trouble. They're tough guys. You know, there's a mentality of uh, you know they, they, I'm gonna you know I'm just gonna beat you up and that's gonna prove you know that's gonna prove my point. But you know he, it's it's encapsulated in that line he has where they're saying you know what do you what do you what are you mad at Johnny? Is, what do you got? <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. And of course, then it would go from there to rebel without a cause, which yeah. is a perfect definition for all this. Rebel without a cause. And so the angry, young, rebellious guy, you know, whether it was uh, Marlon Brando, uh, James Dean, even the young Elvis Presley, uh, the, these guys were kind of the bad, they were the bad boys. And w what happens is most of, almost all these movies, the girls, the, the main character, the lead actress, would... Uh, a lot of times, snub a nice boy next door or a nice guy and go for the bad boy. And that, that's when we really started getting this poison image of the bad boy. And I talk about this in the book, how uh, they, have, you know, they have websites about you know, the, the, the hottest bad boys and things like that. And that's, it leads to – I can't remember the name of it, but there's a mental illness. You know, and it, it would have to be a mental illness, for, but, but, and it's exclusively female. Where you don't like, you're not going to have any any males that are want to marry like a female serial killer. Nobody. There's no male in the phone who wants to do that. <laughs> but but there are females that that lined up for uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Charles God. Manson. Yeah, well, it's definitely Charles Manson yeah. and the the, the uh, serial killer that uh, that I'm I'm blanking uh, on. Ted now. Bundy. Well, well, Ted Bundy definitely, and the and the one that was eating his victims, I they, they, what's his. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but all the worst. Yeah, J Charles Manson was going to marry a twenty-some-year-old good-looking girl when he was eighty. Dahmer. Yeah, it's a Dahmer. Yeah, yeah Dahmer. Yeah, and um, so this is a, the, the, obviously the ultimate. The ultimate bad boy would be a serial killer, and uh, the fact that any woman on the face of the earth would be attracted to that is very troubling. And that's when you get into you know, in, in my case, you know, I don't shy away from controversial things, but I think. Again, you have to understand what is, and I talk about the studies in there that uh, that show they've done studies in recent years that show that females 
they'll have studies of, of males naturally, you know, and this seems reasonable to me that uh, they are, are attracted by girls liking them. You know, they, 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 they like that. They like to be liked. Where on the other hand, the females, the exact opposite. They don't want the, the guys that like them. They're attracted to the ones that don't. And that's the weird. I don't, and I don't, I don't think that's natural. I really, I really think that's not a natural human biological thing for females. I think it was created from the 1950s on where this message went out over and over again. You want the bad guy. Well, that's like, that, di- like the, the, the desire for diamonds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You want, you want, you, you don't, you don't want the guy that's going to treat you nice and the, and the good guy. He's boring. And that, what is that? It's boring. I mean, does, does, do it, would any of us, would any male, if you had a nice, sweet girl that treated you well, say that's boring? I mean, I, I can't think of anybody that would, but and again, I don't think it's something where it's an instinct that females have. I think it's something that they've learned from, uh, from all the movies and television shows that have taught them that. Of course, it's, it's, you know, it's, it started there, and now you have whatever. You, can, you still see that bad boy image being promoted now, and they, now it's you know, tattoos and all, all, all kinds of other things where it's being promoted as being sexy. And, uh, and I think that's all part of it, that because those, those bad boys, they're, they always have the bully image. They're not, just by definition, by calling them bad boys, they're doing bad things, right? Mm-hmm. So, and again, I just, I, I think it's, uh, so all of this I think is, uh, is part of the culture and I think it's, we're all absorbing it, but you're before the 1950s, again, when teenagers were born, because until that time, that's the first time the uh, media started uh, catering to that demographic. And you had a lot of the great, I mean, I still love those great, you know, monster films, you know, the, the monster, they ate Pittsburgh and things like, you know, that kind of stuff where, that were, uh, giant creatures trampling cities and UFO films and all that. But they were always geared, you know, teenagers from outer space, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. to, to teenagers. Before that, they, you never had films that were, you know, always had films for kids, and you still do, but not for that particular demographic. And ever since, and you talked about uh, Can't Buy Me Love and things like that in the 80s. And it's, it, it I don't, today, I, th- I guess they still have them, but certainly in the 80s, I had a lot of those high school films that were, uh, uh, Three o'clock high was another one that that were geared uh, specifically to teenagers, and there was always a message. And the other message that was there, I think it's powerful, is that this kind of teenage angst, which mm-hmm. was probably born with Catcher in the Rye, the novel Catcher in the Rye, uh, you know, where uh, the, the character is uh, Holden Caulfield is just kind of mad at. He yeah. doesn't know why. He's just mad. You know? J.D. Salinger had an intelligence connection. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he just kind of dis, you know, kind of weird where the guy was a successful writer and then just <laughs> yes. don't bother me for the last 50 years or something. Very weird guy. You'd think you want to keep writing. Well, they were preparing the country for the, for the rebellion of the 60s, the youth rebellion. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, and that's where it's, you can see where it started. It started with those types where you don't really know. There's no Vietnam War to protest. And you notice those characters in the 50s, they weren't. They weren't upset at the Korean War or anything. They just were. They were just walking around, and most of their hostility was directed at their parents. Mm-hmm. Rebel without a cause. James Dean is mad at his parents, and the parents appear to be nice. They don't. But again, it's that they started driving a wedge. I don't think there's evidence before that era that teenagers hated their parents. But it's been so successful that there's not a teenager in America that doesn't start rolling their eyes when they get to be 13 at their parents and think their parents are the dumbest people on the earth. And, and that, that it's, I, I don't think there's evidence that that happened before the 1950s, but I think all this plays into it. Cause that's the kind of the milieu that uh, kids are now absorbing whether, and certainly with the internet, they uh, they're absorbing it a lot more and they get, they get to go on these social media forums and can express themselves and uh, in any way they want. And of course, naturally being immature, they're going to start directing that hostility at each other. And uh, when you see these, you know, I mentioned I get distraught if I don't get enough likes or comments. And certainly teenage girls that are taking selfies every 30 seconds, yeah. you know, when they're putting these pictures up, of, of course, what do they want to hear? Oh, God, you're so hot. You look great. That's what they want to hear. So when they're getting the opposite, oh, God, you know, what happened to your face? You know, you know, you uh you know, does your face hurt because it's killing me? You know, that kind of stuff. Or, or you know, uh, did you gain weight? Or uh, you should kill. And, of course, in most of these cases, I have the quotes uh, from many of these cases where they, these kids are dared to kill themselves. And I, you probably heard, I guess, about a year ago where the first case that went to court 
where there was a girl that uh, was texting back and forth with a guy and basically saying, you're going to do it. Don't check it out. And he ended up killing himself and they took her to court. I don't, I don't know if she was convicted or not, but you may see that happen in the future because it's happening more and more with these callous kids. And I don't know if, if they feel bad after it actually happens or they just are, don't have empathy. They're a little psychopaths because that's, again, that's a huge, one of the big characteristics of psychopaths and bullies mm-hmm. is that they don't have, I mean, you'd have to have no empathy if you're taking a weaker person and, you know, stuffing his head in the toilet or something, you know, just crazy stuff bullies do. You, you'd have to have no empathy to realize, first of all, you're not, the kid, the person's not doing anything to you. He doesn't represent any threat. He's weaker than you. But of course, that's a big characteristic. Well, I, I think the, the powers that be want to incur, and I kind of alluded to it, is where uh, why would the Pentagon have, you know, consulting uh, interest in like cupcake wars? And look at the wars. Everything's wars, right? Uh, yeah. You know, a cutthroat kitchen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, 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 I, I talk about the uh, bullies yeah. and uh, the chefs. I mean, they're, they're, yes. they're, they all have Gordon Ramsay types. I mean, they're, and, and, and people, uh, you know, I don't, I don't understand it. And it's just like when Donald Trump had his reality show. So many people loved it when he said, "You're fired." You know, they they got off. And I, I don't, I don't understand that. But it it appears to appeal to a lot of people. And I think again, the reason why bullies are successful everywhere is because they, even if you don't like them, and, and that's you know like a bully coach. So you know, you don't have to like me, but you're gonna damn well respect me. It's that kind of stuff. And respect is. Uh, you well, know, and I think it's emblematic of a society that worships. Uh, success, meaning mammon, money, yeah. rather than truth and virtue. Right, because until we, it, we, we, let's look at it, the, the, the qualities that I, I personally admire. You know, I, I admire kindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't say I admire meekness, but I, I like gentleness, gentle people, uh, empath, empathetic people, people that care about other people. Um those are not qualities that people, that most people admire. They're considered weak. Mm-hmm. Those are weaknesses. Whereas the qualities that turn me off, I, I don't like aggressive people at all. I can't stand aggressive people. Confrontational. Those, these are bully qualities, but they're, they're qualities of the successful. You know, they're the people that are, uh, you know, are, uh, or, you know, what do you, the rat race, you know, the, the just the, uh, the, the expression the rat race yes it tells you what you're you know we're all we're all fine you want to be first in the rat race you got to get ahead of the, of the other guy and uh was it uh oh god i can't think of the guy's name the guy from usa today that was a uh, first class bully and and he admitted it and uh you know he talked about all the dead or not the bodies that he climbed over to get to the top and stuff and and there's obviously that's the reality in the business world as well and so what what uh, other than maybe i guess the world i'm in the world of writing i don't uh, you know i although i guess they're bully writers too but that's something where you can maybe succeed without doing that because you're just kind of creating your own uh, your own thing but in most uh, occupations uh, we see it over and over i talk about the metal gun, in, 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 most doctors have bullying attitudes uh, a lot of nurses bully staff under them i talk about it's a big problem certainly cops police officers we see the bully personality in full display and well they, in, like in medicine it's designed with uh residents where they become uh, they given they more or less they're captured and you can exploit them they can work these 16 17 hour yeah. shifts you yeah know. And, that, and that's that's the basis going back to the fraternity mentality. It's born there where, and it it, it goes on into uh, firefighters and police officers. All, most of these industries, um, air, flight attendants. I mean, all these. I, I I've, I've seen stories about how bullying is common in all these all these industries, and it seems to be uh, the world of wrestling. They talked about a lot about that. It, it, it's and I I have the quotes in the book from people that it's and they're almost word for word the same, and it's basically. We got to, you know, you we got to earn your, you, you have to earn our trust. We got to know that you have our back, and somehow you earn that by going through torture, you know, going through initiations, a lot of sometimes, you know, being physically abused, and after that, once you've agreed to do that and you join the fraternity or the industry, whatever it is, then you're going to be able to do it to the new recruits. Well, the system, that's the way of a system is preserving itself. That's yeah. like boot camp in the military. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. perfect yeah. boot camps, and I mean, it's. it's Every drill sergeant, I mean, by definition, is a drooling, snarling bully. 
and people are yeah. entertained by it. I mean, everyone yeah, knows oh, yeah. like everyone's favorite uh, part of um, uh, that St- Stanley Kubrick movie. Yeah, what was it? Um, Full Metal Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket was the first yeah. part when they're in the boot camp. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because sure. they're being entertained by this bully. Uh, drill sergeant who doesn't turn out too well for him. So, but. No, yeah, and, and, and that's, I, I think, again, it's a, we, but, you know, people respect that. They respect. Well, I think what it is, they can say, well, you know, it's the military. You need to do this because when you go in the battle, they need to right, uh, right. be prepared for it. You can make that, that excuse. But the problem is they apply it to everyday life. And believe yep. me, you don't want to apply the norms of military life to civilian life. No, and, and that's yeah. why, you know, again, mil- military, automatically, we see this in sports world or anything mm-hmm. where, just, you know, thank you for your service, all that nonsense. And, and it, where it's just automatically assumed, wow, you know, you're a cut or above, you know, you're, you know, it doesn't matter. And, and if you expose some of the things that these troops are doing, for instance, where uh, Bradley Manning, mm-hmm. now Chelsea Manning, you get thrown in jail. And God knows what happens to you there, which might explain why he's now Chelsea. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and solitary confinement, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, maybe going back to prison again, but... And that, again, I said I talk a lot about whistleblowers, and this bleeds over to the political world, where it, it's not just Edward Snowden and Assange and Manning that are they're the most high-profile ones, but I have a whole section on there. What happens to uh, r- people who are, are whistleblowers in, in any job? They're retaliated against always, and uh, it's it, it, there's uh, I talk about the whole thing about. Uh, you know, uh, it, it snitches get stitches and all that stuff, mm-hmm. which is a very popular expression. Where, and if you if you watch the old Hollywood films, the most uh, standard, especially the old gangster films, where uh, whether it's Jimmy Cagney or the East Side Kids or any of that stuff, where you know the, a guy will be beaten to a pulp, but you don't rat out your, you know, you don't even even though they they may be murderers, they may have killed somebody, you don't rat in, uh, in prisons. The only thing that's on a par with pedophiles are snitches, dirty rats. And um, what does that say? Because, I mean, and again, I talk about how the difference between a tattletale and uh, how many teach, so many teachers look at kids who report bullying as tattletales. I don't want to hear it. And I have a whole section on that where I don't, I don't stand tattletales. Well, what if some kid is, you know, (laughs) is is being abused or something and, and you don't want to hear it. You're not even, and again, what is that? We talked about when the bell rings, this is where kids learn when they start switching classes. They learn to obey. Mm-hmm. They got to be someplace. But they also learn, they first recognize that this is, these are government employees. These are government, they, they, basically your government leaders when you're a kid are those teachers. And uh, they're all doing this on the public dime. We're all paying their salaries to do this, to not perform the, up to expectations, I don't believe. But they learn. Well, yeah. You look at public schools as giant Skinner boxes, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and, and I, one of those yeah. brilliant anonymous souls on the internet said this is the first time where you learn that authority is corrupt and that they're not gonna that they're not they don't do the right thing, they don't catch it and they don't do what they're supposed to do. You, everybody, whether they maybe on a subconscious level, but most of those people learn as high school students when they see the kids getting away with things, the wrong people punished or whatever. Uh, when they see that, are the teachers not? recognizing a, a situation they should be, you know, get in, in the middle of. They recognize, okay, um, these are, you know, the government isn't working for, they're not going to protect me or defend me. And of course that translates into adult life where your congressional representative is not going to represent you. You learn quite quickly mm-hmm. that they don't have your interest at heart and, uh, or anything. Your military, if, you, if you're awake enough, you know that they're not fighting for your freedom. They're following orders and they're over. In many cases, they're, uh, killing civilians or raping or whatever in the whatever lands they occupy in. So it's a, it's all tied in. The whistleblower America and again I think the reason why there's this anti whistleblower mentality amongst the people, you know, the majority of people, unfortunately, is because most of the people recognize that those whistleblowers are blowing the whistle on wrongdoing and it ties into that you know, whatever this wrongdoing, at, at some level, it, it goes over into that bullying type of psychopathic behavior. Something's, you know, they're they're, uh, you know, they're sexually harassing women, or they're uh, they're, uh, they're, they're tremendous favoritism, and there's a something going on where they're stealing company funds and you know, things like that. Things that are more sophisticated versions of uh, of the wrongdoing we see in in high school when they're yeah. just. Uh, and it's, it's it's I think it's all part of the mentality. Unfortunately, most people side with the uh, 
the uh, the people that are that are uh, the wrongdoers rather than the whistleblowers, and that's a sad commentary on our society. Well, except high school never ends, and the high school, the post-war high school setting was perfect for the post-war American empire. And uh, yes. you have to again. A lot, I think a lot of the discomfort is when whistleblowers or tattletalers is they, it uh, not only does it expose the rot of the system, uh, which uh, I guess uh, upsets people's uh, pleasant illusions, but it also um, kind of calls them out and maybe you're, 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 what are you trying to spur me to action? I, now I have to do something? No, shut up. You know, I got my yeah. paycheck. You know, I don't want to, Well, it is. And yeah. it, it's, I think it's, it's, you know, we, it's incumbent on, because all of us, uh, I mean, my kids are out of school. I don't know if your kids are, but, are, and lots of people don't have kids. And, but all of us have to pay taxes. We all pay these teacher salaries. Mm -hmm. And, we have a right to expect that, especially when it's our kids, but even if not, I, I resent the fact that any kid, no child should be going to uh, an educational facility and enduring any of this. It just should never happen. And you can understand, it, of course, like, the, the adults can't be, but you have security cameras everywhere now. So they capture, they have this Orwellian presence in the school. So none of this should be happening because once a kid, once they know there's an allegation, they ought to be able to look at the cameras. Let's roll the videotape and see. Okay, well, they're telling the truth. And uh, you have police presence everywhere in the schools now. But the police presence hasn't resulted, and I, I can't uh, find an example anywhere of a cop stopping a bully because I think instinctively most cops side with the bullies because they have the bully personality, personality themselves. So you have the worst of all worlds. And then I talk about at the same time all this is going on, you have these draconian rules where – while they're not protecting people who are really being uh, bullied emotionally and, and physically, while they're not doing that, they're going after kids for the most ridiculous transgressions. They'll expel them for taking an aspirin. In one case, a kid had an asthma inhaler, inhaler which he needed. They took the inhaler away from him, and the rest of the day almost died. These are horrific things that are how you know we've heard the ones about the, the kid uh, biting a pop tart in the shape of a gun and getting in trouble. Or kindergartners hugging each other at recess and being charged with sexual harassment. So at the same time, they're not catching bullying. They're they're punishing kids for the most ridiculous things imaginable. And when you factor in all these hideous drills, I have a whole section of that that are very real. And these are not Sandy Hook things like that where conspiracy theorists or whatever are involved. These are admitted fake shootings they're they're they, yes, what they do yes. they, they hire crisis actors yes they do exist crisis actors mm -hmm. org, to play the shooter and the sh it's always a scripted politically correct thing where it's usually a demented homeschooler or an angry guns right activist or something <laughs> uh, always that you know it's never it's never uh you know some uh you know crazed bernie sanders fan or something it's never <laughs> that but uh they uh they come in and they the students are never, and you talk about psychological torture. Yes, this is sadistic. They don't tell the students that's the drill. They don't yeah. tell the students. Imagine how mortified they are, thinking they're just, uh, uh, or you have to teach them to, to what do you mean? I, I've never been around a mash. Well, what, that's, what? that's like the odds of that happening. I mean, you got to worry about, they're more likely to get hit by a car on the way home, walking yeah. home from school than, than that, or getting in an automobile accident. That's obviously, that is conditioning psychological warfare. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was talking a couple of years ago, I was talking to a mother who, who told me that they had a drill at their school and the yeah. kid came home terrified thinking yeah. he didn't know that he was at risk of getting shot at school. Now he, you mean, I can get shot at school. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, exactly. And, Thank you. And sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Feel safe so, now? Tax dollars of work. Yeah. And, and that, that, often they line kids up and the police were like uh, were at gunpoint were lining these kids up and them. You know, uh, you know, or march them out of. I mean, this is like, what are you trying to? I know what they're trying to achieve here. Yeah. You know, a lot of it is is is, is the why why the individuals are participating in the, the police is because they're paid to do it over yeah. time. The money is there to do it. I don't know right. if they're in on on the the big picture, but the big picture is this: they're conditioning kids for this type of uh, treatment, being Absolutely. marched off somewhere. Just the idea that you need a cop in the hallway. When I was in high school, there was no no police presence anywhere. Oh, I, I would have been shocked to see it. Yeah. I, I, but it's and and so. Man, by the way, the doors are open all day. You could walk in. Didn't have to go through yeah, a security yeah. system that you do now. Oh, I, I and I talk about one kid that was punished for being polite. He saw, of course, of course, the doors were locked, mm -hmm. and he saw an adult that he knew walking up to the door with boxes in the hands or something. So he opened the door for him. He got in trouble because he violated school policy. So it's amazing where they had these stringent 
uh, authoritarian type of rules on on little things like that. But and and you also have the kids getting arrested in school. They, they've had kids arrested for burping, for yawning too close to the teacher, for writing non vulgar things like things like "I love so and so" on their on their school desk. They're being arrested, and uh, in in some cases. Uh, they're they're rolling up fines. It's it's unbelievable. Then have drag queen story hour at the local library for kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we they, they, you had that thing. Uh, SCTV had a skit called Library Police years ago. You couldn't have that any day where because they've had that now. They've yeah. actually had cops go to the house of a little kid that had an overdue library book. So <laughs> the library cop, cop from Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we we uh, you know, it's not satire anymore, and and but. So how you know what that we... is is, is uh, they they found out like there's, what was the Department of Education had a SWAT team yeah because yeah. Uh, this is all part of the you, there's a reason for this funding was kicked in for this after 2001 and various inspector generals offices the various bureaucracies all wanted a SWAT team of their own then they got yeah. nothing to do so they started dispatching SWAT teams who were laid on their street. yeah yeah okay. <laughs> how about that yeah yeah sure you had to go through those criminals but but so you would think that with all of this. Um, Hovering presence, this this huge uh, state authoritarian type presence controlling all the, the normal uh, student behavior. Certainly, well, it's 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 anarcho tyranny. Is a Sam Lefantis, anarcho tyranny. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a good line. But and, 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 and quite frankly, as the social order, the moral order decays, largely aided by the public school system itself being taught now and the culture that's being promoted by Hollywood and by the powers that be, is uh, you you lack. The moral order decays. You lack social order, so you get endless uh, examples or pretext, pretense, pretexts for this type of clampdown because society's decaying, families are decaying. So the normal, uh, 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 the normal modes of behavior or, or moral codes that we just assumed were normal don't exist anymore. No, we don't. And and yeah. you would think though, with with this kind of police state mentality where uh, our student or and with the security sign-ins and parents have gotten mm -hmm. in trouble for taking the kids out with all this presence there you would think that it would be impossible for bullying to to prevail because how, how would they not catch that if they're catching you know somebody uh yawning i mean how how is that not possible but somehow while well, this is the yin and yang thing while that's that's why i said the schools are doing it all wrong they've got this police state presence they're like veritable prisons in many cases, but this terrible bullying is worse than ever. And if, I, I don't know, I don't even know how to explain it. Like I said, the rabbit hole runs so deep here because, uh, like one of the other uh, parents that I talked to in more tragic cases, um, his uh, name was Bailey O'Neill, a kid who was beaten to death at recess. He was 11 years old, and uh, well, he wasn't beaten to death. He, he got in a, again. They called it a fight, and again, it was at recess, sixth grade. There's going to be some adults out there. And somehow they missed it. So, but typically it was a bigger kid that jumped him, and it wasn't a fight. He beat him up. Uh, they went back to class. He wasn't even sent to the school nurse's office. I, I think he complained. You know, his head was hurting, so they sent him and gave him an aspirin. He didn't even notify his parents. He came home, uh, told him what happened, and he started talking about his head was really hurting him. So they took him to the emergency room, found out he had a concussion and a fractured nose. He ends up going home, gets worse and worse. They, he ends up going into a coma and dies a few days later. Now. Tragic. Eleven years old. His father. I talked to his father on the phone, Rob O'Neill, and he told me, he, you know, he said, "Look, I went to the emergency room. He told me he had a concussion and a fractured nose. I know my son died because of this kid that killed him at recess." By his, and the media got involved, and I have quotes from the articles in there. They oh, were overtly poo-pooing that it was that the fight had anything. To, I mean, you, you just don't die at eleven years old naturally. And they said, well, he had epilepsy, and they said his epilepsy was under control. You don't, in, in, in this day and age, you don't die from epilepsy anymore. That's ridiculous. But they, again, they tried to make it seem as if, and I, you know, this was before the social hierarchy should have set in. It was sixth grade. But the most incredible part, the rabbit hole goes so deep here. The medical examiner was involved. He held a press conference, and he, un he said unequivocally, without hesitation, the fight had nothing to do with this boy's death. Now, I, I don't know what that even means. How deep does the rabbit hole go here? The medical examiner is involved. I talked to the boy's father. He had a concussion and a fractured nose. It obviously had something to do with his death. He was a, 11, a healthy 11-year-old before that. So what does that tell us? What What is happening here that a medical examiner can be, in, you know, can, and I mean, it's almost like a, you know, JFK assassination type thing. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, what are they covering up? I, I don't – I can't explain that. All I can do is, you know, report it and uh, and sit there and uh, – I'll give you another example. There was another – a girl that was 12 years old that, that Rebecca Sedgwick that – either jumped or was pushed off a water power a, a tower in, in Florida after being relentlessly bullied for a long time. They knew who the two girls who were bullying. They had the names. In fact, uh, for once, law enforcement there was going to do their job, and they were going to charge them with something. But uh, the pressure from the media especially got them to back off. Yeah, the media was siding with the bullies, as they always do. And I, I communicated with Rebecca's mother uh, several times. And I uh, had an exchange of emails with a, uh, one of these anti-bullying experts who was very much in the camp of the bullies, as they all are. And she thought she was proving something. She said, I'm going to send you the police report, the full police report in this case. I said, okay, good. Well, the police report was full of documentation of these two girls doing the bullying and how they knew they were responsible, you know, leaving messages on social media, gloating, and all, again, all these things that should be evidence. So I... I emailed her back and I said, well, thanks for this. This is great. It, it just proves conclusively what I've been saying. And she goes, well, I don't see it that way. So I, I, I don't know what that means. I don't know, I don't know what she's seeing because it, it demonstrated com- conclusively that they were uh, responsible. But this, again, that's 12-year-old girls. What, why are they reluctant to hold – and a girl died because – and there's some indication from what one of the girls said that she may have pushed her. I don't know. But either way – she was responsible, but even in cases, like I said, where they named the bullies in the suicide notes, the anti-bullying experts, all the experts come out and fall all over themselves to say, no, it's not related to bullying. Now, what does that mean? I, I, I can't begin to tell you. I think it's all tied in some way to the social hierarchy thing, but it just seems amazing to me that when they're, when they're holding children accountable for you know, the things that have been going on forever – you know, burping or, you know, uh, you know, pointing their fingers like guns, hugging each other. These are normal human behaviors. We, we should want kids to be able to hug each other. Um, but they're holding that displays of affection, all that. They're, they're, they're cracking down on that and stopping it. But they're going overboard in protecting these vicious, you know, kids who lack empathy and are have psychopathic traits and are torturing other kids to the point where these kids – don't want to live any longer, even at really young ages. And I don't know what's it, what's behind that. All I can do is just is, is just sit there and report it and just be continue to be astonished that everybody doesn't see it this way. But there are people that look at this and they just they will just oh it's complex or so. I I, I don't know what to tell you. You know they're, they're telling you why they're doing it. They're giving you so how you say it's complex. I don't know, but you for whatever reason you want this bullying, and I think it's because. They know that bullying is enabled, and it's part and parcel of this social hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have popular kids, uh, like one, one of the most poignant statements, there's a movie called Bully, made a few years ago by Lee Hirsch. And uh, it concentrated on, I think, four different kids who ended up killing themselves and had been bullied. And one of the kids uh, was, uh, again, like 11 years old or something, and his, fr- his little 11-year-old friend Again, more profound than all the anti-bullying experts in the world. He, he just looked in the camera at one point and he said, I wish there was no such thing as popularity. And he hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what the problem is. Now, you know, of course you can't, you can't really mandate something like that. But because they are having these certain kids wear their football jerseys to school on Friday. Yeah, yeah. It's artificial, they're, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where they're giving them Letterman jackets. They're given uh, – they're, they're, in case you don't know who the cheerleaders are – here we because they're they're having uh, prom ca- queens and, and homecoming queens, all these things that are bestowing favors, bestowing accolades on young impressionable minds who, whose egos are being formed. So it's it's blowing their self esteem up so that what happens? They become conceited and they start treating their their kids who aren't popular dismissively. So at best. They're not going to say hello to you, and you, it might be. And it happens over and over again. I've heard many accounts where, you know, kids were, and we've seen movies about it too. But it's it's a real phenomenon where uh, your your friends and you know, as little kids, and then you get to middle school and high school, and one of you becomes popular and the other one doesn't. So suddenly he or she doesn't know you anymore. You know, turns their nose yeah. up at you. And, yeah. and yeah, I, I knew actually a couple of accounts of, of that happened. You know, oh, it's it's yeah. it's it's it's, it's, and, it's and it's because. Yeah. Because there is popularity, because they know, everybody knows that one is popular and one isn't. So, but who enables that? The reason it's, it, it, like, it doesn't happen, if, if there was no school, 
for instance, in the neighborhood, and I, I knew that, for, like some kids who, who weren't friendly to you in school, they, if they were in your neighborhood, they still would be. They'd acknowledge your existence there because you weren't in the school. But in the school... Well, it goes back to that school creating. It's the institution. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's institutionalized. It's a social hierarchy. And I think it's at the heart of it. It's why bullying exists because it enables those kids. It, it makes them conceited and arrogant beyond belief. And High school was created to create this very situation you are spelling out here, which is why they're so resistant to addressing the problem. Yeah, and, yeah. They, and they clearly are because they – and I think that's why everybody is reluctant because how many people in the media, in law enforcement and uh, – I mean this factors in everything. If you make popularity something you desire, something that does exist and therefore something to be desired – you could market that and sell product because the product can make you popular. The car, you know, right? The right deodorant, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, That's it's when... like it's it's so it all fact. And you don't think people who are, are in control of society have examined? I mean, they, it's become very scientific. The study of human of humanity and psychology. Edward Bernays, you know, it, the father of modern you know PR and propaganda. These things. This is how you rule over a society, and it's going it's going to filter down, or drill down into the education system because that's where it starts. You know, absolutely. This is why yeah. high school never ends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> that's why they learn it. Yeah, Bowling yeah. for Soup had that song, "High School Never Ends," yeah. and uh, um, it's a nice song. And uh, but it's true. And again, people. I mean, I uh, talk in the in the book about is there life? There was a book called "Is There Life After High School" by Ralph Keys, which had an impression on me when I read it when I was young. In fact, he's my Facebook friend. I need to try to contact him sometime. But uh, he uh, talked about how, uh, like people like uh, when they, uh, what's his name, Phil Spector, of course, ended up you know getting mm -hmm. a, uh, went to prison for murder eventually. But he apparently was abused a lot in high school, mm -hmm. and uh, he went. He he felt so stung by it that he made this huge production out of going to. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was <clears throat> five year year. I think it was five year and maybe ten year, but. He went there in a huge limousine, very ostentatious. He went in and just kind of marched around and just gave everybody the air, didn't talk to anybody, and then walked back out or something. So it was – he felt the need to do it. And Kurt Vonnegut, who I uh, quote at the uh, beginning of the book about, you know, true terror is, is knowing that uh, – waking up and realizing the people he went to high school are in charge of the country. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, he he had a, a experience where apparently he was shamed by a gym teacher in high school and – he held on to it for decades, even after he was, a, you know, an award-winning author and one of the great novelists of the 20th century. And he, he con he had to contact the guy just to let him know how he still was, you know, scarred by that experience. Decades later, and he said it was more cathartic than all the therapy he'd ever had. And uh, you know, people like Dustin Hoffman, who became um, a big movie star, he uh, apparently, supposedly, still today, he still harbors like, you know. They were really uh, bad feelings about how, about being bullied in high school. So if that can happen to people like that. Just imagine the people, because obviously the vast majority of people don't go on to lead lives like Dustin Hoffman. Most of them are the kind of people I describe in the book. They end up as unhappy. A lot yeah. of them, a lot of them are never able to marry, or never don't have kids, don't have families, are lonely and bitter in their old age, and uh, can never succeed much in life because they don't have any confidence. They have that defeated look of the victim that they learned in high school. They probably fear, you know, they, they look at the, the loudest, most dominant personality maybe where they work and just, it's, you know, it's like, it's like the lion looking at the, for the gazelle, you know, looking for their prey. And uh, those kinds of personalities can sense, okay, this is the guy I can start playing practical jokes on. They can't really bully him like they did in high school. But what happens in that environment? It's the practical jokes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thin line there between that, and of course, then it's 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 the idea is to humiliate them, and of course, there's always going to be coworkers around to enable the bully, as they did in high school. You had an audience then, you got an audience in the workplace where you're laughing at. Maybe not as many, and some of them matured enough to say that's not funny, that's stupid, or something. But there's still going to be enough there. If he has, and of course, the only reason the bully is able to exist is because of that audience, because it's, if if they didn't. Most of the bullying is done where others can see it and laugh at it and share, you know, share in the glory. If the audience uh, intervened, first of all, but at least so that stupid and turned their backs and walked away, what's the bully going to do? It's not satisfying. Yeah. And uh, but so they're, they're so really we're the crowd is all to blame too for uh, 
for enabling it. But, you know, you can look at the extends in the political world. The, the mob is you know, to blame for everything, for yeah. being indifferent, indifferent and allowing the tyranny and the corruption to continue. So I think this, even though it, it doesn't seem like a, a political issue, it is. It's all tied in the things we talk about with the whistleblowers and just kind of the uh, the learned behavior is to follow rules and uh, – uh, we, you know, the first indication of, uh, you know, you know what to expect when you're in high school. By the time I got out of high school, I had an impression of teachers, and it wasn't a positive one. You know, there were very few. I can think of maybe two or three teachers and throughout my 12 years in, in public school that made any kind of positive impression on me. For the most part, they were either negative or they just, you know, they were indifferent government workers that you knew. It made it really clear to everyone they were on a time clock. Mm-hmm. And they didn't I, – I never sent – I mean, for instance, as a writer, even at that time, I remember uh, – I wasn't very motivated, but I remember I was friends with the valedictorian, a girl who I, you know, I, I liked her a lot. And I, she, she resented me because I could write – I mean, I would be sitting in the library with her, and, I, and we'd have a half hour left, and I'd just write you know, a, a paper. And she, you know, she'd been studying all week, and she used to hate that, and I'd get a good grade <laughs> on it. But I mean, I, I, at that time, I knew I could write, and, uh, but nobody – Nobody sensed that. You know, I never had an English teacher tell me, wow, you have talent, nothing. And I, I had it then. I was already writing stories and stuff. And uh, I knew I had it. So luckily I didn't, I didn't let that bother me. But uh, you'd think an English teacher would, you know, would be able to, to kind of see that, see the potential. But I think it's because, again, they just weren't uh, – they're not there for that. They're there – you know, they're there just kind of to keep you in order maybe and uh, – Make sure you're there and they're, you know, uh, take attendance and all that kind of stuff. Did you do your homework? That kind of thing. And uh, apparently nowadays, especially with uh, bullying going on inside the classroom, they're somehow not able to catch uh, catch the uh, culprits doing it. And, and you know, if, if there was the case of the, the kid, there were uh, somebody, some kid pulled a knife on a student inside a classroom and a very brave fellow student <clears throat> ran over and intervened and wrestled the knife away from them. I mean, I, you know, I, I, my, it was my kid. I would have been mortified they took that chance, but uh, still pretty heroic. Well, what happened? Two things. First of all, the kid that wrestled the knife away got in trouble. Yeah. yeah because he violated that. policy. He was not supposed to do that. And again, no one mentioned the teacher. You know, where, oh, where was the teacher? And, and in, another, in one other case where there was a teacher actually did <clears throat> intervene in a fight, the teacher got in trouble. Because their policy was if there was a fight, the teachers were not supposed to intervene. I mean, I, 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 I don't – what does that mean? <laughs> I mean so, so you just let – Well, them here you have a case where someone does exert you know, physical exertion, righteous violence, because you could say. And that, of course, that's punished. Yeah, you know, exactly. And, he, he was doing yeah. what the teacher should have done, you know, yeah. really theoretically. But, I mean, uh, and again, where this ever-present law enforcement. The, you, you, know, you have to you call the they, resource officer who isn't anywhere to be found whenever. No, never. And I, yeah. I have a quote from uh, the resource officer. <laughs> this guy, I don't know if he still is, but at the time he was like the uh, <clears throat> the chief resource officer, like for the national resource, I guess, I guess the head honcho, the CEO is a resource officer or something. But, and I have a quote from him where it's it's just the typical – how you'd expect of, you know, uh, <clears throat> bullying is complex, or, you know, clearly coming down on the side of bullies. And this is the guy, the resource officer, as you indicate, that's like kind of like the bottom level. That's one of the first points of contact <clears throat> for a student, supposedly, that's being bullied. Well, if their leader is imparting this wisdom to them that, well, you know, it's a complex issue and we need to, you know, that kind of thing where they're not say, they're not expressing the so-called zero tolerance policy where, <clears throat> you know, that they do apparently uh, utilize for things like you know no aspirin. Yes. No, you know that kind of thing, or you know you you don't point your you know you you brought a butter knife to to lunch, you know that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, and that's a real sense where a girl she accidentally took her father's lunch instead of hers, and he had like a, a paring knife for his apple or something. She got in trouble, and again they didn't expect the they didn't accept the explanation. It, it's so. I guess the, the, one of the overall points of the book, I guess, is that our school systems are pretty much it's worse than anyone thought they were. They're not doing anything right. <clears throat> you know, aside from the fact they're not they're not producing uh, very educated people because they're wasting so much time on uh, standardized tests and uh, uh, this r- ridiculous rote learning and uh, teaching kids things like uh, you know trigonometry and things like that that the vast majority will never use. Yeah. 
where they they should be doing something like okay if you if you uh if you express an interest in history or english or math or whatever to try to channel them in particular directions and not make uh kids you know for instance if you're not i mean i i hated math yeah you know, like and you know okay well you okay you want to learn basic math and that's all you need to know really yeah it, i wait i wasted time on like uh, 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 higher order of math and failing or getting a D when yeah, I mean, nothing so, beyond geometry is really necessary. Exactly, yeah. So and so, you know, why not start channeling people into uh, okay, this is uh, advanced computers or things, you know, things that uh, may come in handy in the uh, in the working world and try to prepare you, but they don't do that. Instead, they waste time with these uh, meaningless standardized tests and uh, things like math, especially that a lot of people. Don't have the aptitude for, don't have the like for, and there's no. Well, need. well the fact that you're, if you like a, a, a class or a particular discipline or study, you the class only lasts fifty minutes. Then it's off to the next class. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and you talk about zero zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. What that does is encourage. What you're saying is that the people who are in charge, you're watching your kids for six seven hours a day. They're not, ex not, they're not expected to show judgment. So right. what does that say about the, the exactly. institution itself? Where zero tolerance. So you can't d uh, discriminate or you can't show any right. judgment. Or why Why am I trusting you with my kids if you don't have that capacity? Well, it's, I can, I can, you know, I can give you another example. I mean, I, I was uh, – I mean, first of all, I taught some. I taught CCD and uh, I uh, – you know, I uh, – Many times, and I uh, taught like a, you know I teach a JFK assassination course now. Mm -hmm. I'm used to being in a teaching environment, but I also coached a lot. I, you know, was, my both my kids played sports, uh, so I, I coached girls and boys sports for a decade, and uh, constantly I was always coaching something. And I never had an experience ever where uh, something happened at my practice or anything. Where again, it, and it, at those situations, it's just most of the time it's just you. A lot of times. Few, if any, especially when they get older, few, if any, parents watch practice. A lot of times you're just there, it's you and your assistant coach or whatever, and the kids. So anything theoretically could happen, but anything that would have happened there would have been my responsibility solely. Mm -hmm. And I can't conceive of one kid uh, physically harming another ever in any of my practices. I, I, I mean, I that I wouldn't have rushed over and understood. I could not conceive it. There was never a threat of it. I, first of all, I never saw, and that's another thing where even though it's organized sports, if it happens outside the school like that, there's there, you just don't see the bullying. I never saw any bullying. You don't see bullying in the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. Either. You, don't, you don't see that stuff there. It's always within these institutions. Something about the school system itself produces it because I never saw it once. And again, as a the responsible authority there, the teacher, if you would, whatever happened, I would, you know, I was going to be blamed for if something. I couldn't say that, you know, uh, like that little kindergartner, like that stupid teacher told the parents she fell. I couldn't say that one of the kids fell and 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 have have them show up when their parents picked them up and look like they've been fifteen rounds in the ring. Mm -hmm. How, how would, and would do you think a parent would have accepted that explanation? But yeah, so, yeah, she but, fell. Well, how many times did she fall? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> she fell over and over again and kept smashing her. I mean, and that's the kind of thing that uh, that or, or let's say if uh, you know the, the the tragic case of the boy. If I had been co I coached basketball, so if I'd been in a gymnasium and uh, the the parents came to pick up the kid and one of the kids was missing and I said I don't know and then they found his body rolled up in a, a mat. Uh, would I have been able to say, oh, I don't know, what happened? I think he was looking for a shoe, because that's what they said. He was looking for a shoe. Uh, so I would have been held responsible. Probably would have ensued. And, and again, I, and I, I wasn't being paid. I'm a, I'm a volunteer. I'm a parent volunteer, but I would have been held under scrutiny. Some, the, I would have been the first person questioned. But same with the Boy Scout leader or, true, or Girl Scout leader or whatever. Uh, they're the part, responsible party, but a teacher – is somehow, even when that little girl, the kindergarten girl, got shot in her class, nothing happened. Nobody, she, nobody knows her name. Now, how is that possible? Can you imagine if somebody had, one of my players had shot another one? I mean, I would have been held responsible. How did you know? How did you? What do you mean? You didn't? How, how did you not see them waving the gun around? That's what I would have said. Well, I if think I, the the answer is the system is the the results we're seeing is is the very results that the system ultimately wants. That's why there's so much resistance to resistance. Yeah, and it's it's because it, and the social hierarchy, because so many people in our society that are in leadership positions benefited from it. 
they led great lives in high school because they were popular. They were cheerleaders. They were uh, football players, basketball players. They were uh, big men on campus, big women on campus. They were prom kings, uh, prom queens, homecoming queens, whatever. They, it was a great experience for them. So they're not going to rock that boat because they, they look at it. They don't look at all the people that, uh, first of all, that are indifferent and are bored by high school and hate it just because they don't want to be there. And they certainly don't have any empathy for the people that are getting picked on because they picked on kids themselves, too, when they were young. So they mm-hmm. benefit. So the, basically, the bullies are in charge. So, of course, they're uh, – and, and the ones that aren't, the ones that, that weren't popular in high school but have been had managed to succeed in the adult world, they're just as anxious to curry favor with the adults in charge as they were to be friends to the, uh, the quarterback and, the, and the, the head cheerleader in high school. They want to be friends. One thing I found, uh, even the, the phenomenon you see recently of a often really good-looking teachers sleeping with their young male students. I'm yeah. sure. You see, I mean, a lot of us, you know, where were these teachers when we were in school? That's uh, <laughs> you know, but can't even conceive of it, right? But it's bizarre. Yeah, it, it's bizarre. But I, the, when, when I could find, uh, well, certainly high school. I mean, I don't think when they were in elementary school. I don't. I can't even figure that out. I don't know what the what the the, the, the mindset is there, but. Uh, in the high school level, when I was able to find out, and a lot of times you can dig a little bit and find anything about the boy who they can't name ever, every time the kid was a popular athlete. And so, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so, so it's again, what is, is this just another perk they're getting now? Not only are they getting all these perks and accolades and they're being, uh, their, their egos being fed and they're becoming arrogant and conceited. Now they're even getting, there's a real possibility they're going to be able to have sex with the best looking teachers. So uh, every boy's fantasy. So, but again, nobody looks at it that way. Nobody's when they're saying it. It's well, the women are monsters, and you know, let's face it, we we don't know what's going on there. We can't conceive of it. But uh, it's never looked at that way. Okay, well, who? They're not just randomly picking on these kids. Yeah, they're picking on particular ones, and is it because they're still immature? Uh, they are just as anxious to be with the popular boys as uh, they were in high school. I don't know, but. It's an aspect of it that I think I was the first one to look at. So that's why this book has a lot of uh, really uh, firsts, I think, in it. And it, it. I think if people read it, it'll, it's, it's, it's eye-opening because you'll, you'll see things like that where nobody else has questioned these things in, in the way I have. And I, I think that's the only way to ever really find out what's happening because the so-called anti-bullying efforts aren't working. And it largely is said because what I've discovered is that Virtually all the anti-bullying experts are on the side of the bullies. Yeah, and if it indeed, if it is indeed a product of the system, the and you can't rely on the very system to reform itself. And it's again, it's a result they ultimately the system wants. So, well, okay, well, the book is um, "Bullyocracy: How the Social Hierarchy Enables Bullies to Rule Schools, Workplaces, and Society at Large." I guess you can get that at uh, is it Trine Day? Trying Day, yeah, it's the first time I've had Trying Day publish it, so it's uh, um, not my usual publisher, but yeah, you can get it through them, or obviously uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever, look around and get the best deal you can. I always tell people, you know, that I don't ask anybody to buy my book, if, just, if, if your library doesn't have it, ask your library to buy it, I get a sale either way, okay. you know, and it's, if I didn't, just, you know, ask your, you know, and uh, spread the word if you do read it, because uh, this is going to depend a lot more on word of mouth than my books normally do because and it's, it's a soft it's a, it gets soft copy and also um kindle right yeah it's like it's a paperback and kindle and yeah. uh so hopefully uh, a lot of people will read it and i think if enough people do maybe uh they'll start demanding answers of the people that are uh, running our schools okay well, listen i want to thank you for coming back on the show and my pleasure tim anytime i always enjoy talking with you and of course they can also follow your 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 work at your 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 blog right Right, donaldjeffries.wordpress.com. I write there regularly. And uh, the uh, the 72-year-old woman I was talking about, I wrote an article um, yesterday uh, called The Story That Didn't Make It Into Bullyocracy. And I told her whole story because it really needs to be read. And Lou Rockwell uh, picked it up on his own. So it's, oh, okay. It's, it's on, uh, LouRockwell.com. Okay. Well, yeah, so, so. well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll post the soon. I do. I'll send you the link. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Okay, then, good night, then. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.